we start our informational night prior. Um, so tonight we have Craig Miller from the Waterfield Design Group here. Um, he has a presentation first, and after you'll have the committee here for any questions or answers. Questions and answers. Okay, thanks. Good to be here tonight. My name is Craig Miller. I'm principal and chief engineer at Waterfield Design Group. We're <laughs> got lucky. Got lucky tonight. I'll make a note of that. <clears throat> no problem at all. So uh, we are uh, civil engineers, landscape architects, and planners. We do a lot of athletic field projects in different towns and communities. We've been working with the town of Sturbridge now for several years, although this project's been on hold for a few years, so it's been a while since we did any design work. But we're back here tonight to uh, describe the project, uh, discuss costs, and answer any questions as you head into a uh, decision, I think, at town meeting at some point. Yep, one month. One month from tonight. So I have a brief presentation to uh, refresh everybody's memory on the project and just explain what everything is, inc what's included in the, in, the, uh, in the plan, and then I'll answer any questions. Um, we're in the dark tonight so that we can see the slides a little bit better, so hopefully this it's a little blurry. We tried to adjust the focus, but we couldn't do that tonight. So this is the existing conditions and the proposed project. I overlaid the two. You have the same thing there, you know? Yeah. So this is the existing gravel road that goes to the existing baseball field and this existing kind of multi-purpose softball and smaller so size soccer field. Quinnebog River is way down here. Uh, DPW is in this vicinity here, and I believe this is the treatment plant, right? Where they get their bearings. And so the project, we've, uh, we've kind of whited out all the lines, and I've got a much clearer picture after this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is just for orientation purposes. We're proposing a Little League baseball diamond here, a full-size 11 v 11 multi-purpose, multi-sport field. So that's 11 v 11 for soccer. Uh, there are Two basketball courts here, a small concession stand, there's parking. This is a bad slide. I'll show you a more detailed slide in a minute, but there's parking here. There's pockets of parking along the proposed road. This is the relocated access road. It comes down. There's some parking around here, and then this is a 6v6 soccer field. So a little closer up on that part of the plan so you can see this in relationship to what's there today. There's the parking as it starts to show up a little bit clearer, the two basketball courts, a small concession stand, and this you see here. And then here is the road. The road, the parking comes right off of the road. That's why they look like they're one and the same because you come in on the access drive and pull into a parking space. So we've kind of tucked in the parking at various spots along the way. Uh, did I get everything? Two basketball, oh, I forgot the bocce courts. So two clay bocce courts right over here. And then uh, 99 parking spaces, and this road, this new, is, is a, not paved, it's gravel, so that the water infiltrates right into the soil so we don't have a runoff issue. Anytime you create new pavement, we have to collect the runoff, treat it, put it back in the ground. Here, we don't have to do that. Uh, and the concession stand, as I mentioned. So here's, again, against existing conditions. But this, this plan actually brings it to life a little bit easier to talk from. So there is wetlands around the site here. We've flagged the wetlands, and so this part of the project is outside of the wetlands, and in fact, it's outside the 25-foot setback as well. So we're, we're clear with conservation in the location and orientation of this field. Uh, you see we've got a little bit of landscaping around the field, the parking, right? And then this part is higher by about four or five feet than this area, because Yes, sir. Is the baseball field northwest or east south? That's a good question. Let's go back. I'll tell you in a second. Mm. Where's my north arrow? The baseball field is east west. East north. west. Well, see, that was a problem at the high school because the baseball field was east west, and sunrise and sunset are a problem in the morning and the afternoon. Yep. So the baseball fields need to be faced north south. 
Well, we thought about pitchers and catchers. No, I understand. In fact, I play baseball myself. I'm a pitcher, and so it bothers me tremendously when the fields are oriented the wrong way. The problem here is the die is cast for us. See this little pocket here? That's the shape of the wetlands. And because well, so you're going to put a baseball field north south. The orientation. Oh, this, 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 this is north south here. This is east west. So yes, we are. That's right. Because we don't have the room. We don't have the room. So pick your poison. We, we, we either don't get the don't field in. OK, sure. So uh, let's see, where was I? Right, so these are the fields. Oh, I was talking about elevation, right. So this is lower, about four or five feet lower. There's uh, some exposed rock ledge on this side. And that's one of the reasons why the costs for the project are what they are. I'll discuss that in a few minutes. But this area is a combination of cut and fill. So we're trimming some of the ledge back, and we're also filling wherever we can to balance the site and make this as practical as possible. Along this edge here is a four to five foot uh, concrete segmental block retaining wall so that as we fill and cut some of this area down, we can balance the site and make it flat. So this, we're, 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 we're working with the grades here to do the best we can to create that big flat plate that the soccer field needs. Uh, let's see. So uh, in terms of costs, our, our total cost for the project is we did an update as part of this effort. We have brought it up into $2017. It, and the last time we did a cost estimate was 2014 or 15. And so our current cost has this at uh, six point six million dollars for all this infrastructure. Oh, I forgot to mention, so these two fields are lit. This has got lights, four light towers, and so is this one. These are all natural grass fields. This is a skinned in field, even though it's shown as colored. Um, and so these two fields are light, lit. The other field is not. The, uh, there's lighting for the, obviously for the parking and the, the drives, and there's lighting for the basketball. Uh, we talked, Annie and I talked prior to the meeting, what's on the plan presently is Porta Johns in, in terms of restrooms. We, at the time we did the design, we had not included a fully functioning restroom just because cost was starting to creep up. And so what's in the project now is uh, Porta Johns. I know that's less than ideal. It's a cost issue that we can uh, wrestle with with you if, if, if you decide to approve the project. And you know, with the treatment plant being so close, somewhat cost effective to get there except for the rock. So we've got to find a way to get a pipe from here down to the treatment plant and try to avoid the rock as much as possible as we get the pipe there. So the cost, as I mentioned, $6.6 .6 million. Uh, the big drivers on the cost is the rock ledge excavation. We've got an estimate here for the rock ledge at $2 million. That's a big number. The reason we've put the number so high is, is a couple of different factors. Uh, anytime you're at a stage like this, you want to be on the higher side of an estimate than on the lower side. The last thing I want to do is encourage you to go after a project because you think the number's right and then find out later that it's higher. So I always like to be on the low side later and the high side now. Uh, we used uh, the weighted averages for our determination of the uh, cost to remove the rock ledge. This is a tough one because uh, there aren't many projects that have this much ledge removal in this particular location. The state average price that we used to determine the rock ledge excavation is typically for trench for pipelines. So those are two different animals, apples and oranges in terms of the cost. At the time when we were trying to go out for bid for this originally several years ago, we, we canvassed a few local contractors to see if we could get tighter pricing just so that we'd have a little higher confidence level and, and actually try to bring that n estimate number down. <laughs> and they were reluctant to give us you know, a number that we could count on unless it was a real bid. So we had this kind of chicken and egg thing. You know, they, they thought it could be a lot less, but they weren't willing to commit because we hadn't really officially bid the job yet. They didn't want to put a lot of time in, so we had this kind of back and forth. Uh, in some cases, we've seen projects where a, uh, a rock crushing entity would actually get, uh, give a, a, a very uh, low price because they want the material. And that's just a matter of uh, kind of the luck of the drawer. If we can get a, a rock company who just happens to be low on materials, then he would bid this a lot more competitively 
than if he had a glut of materials and didn't really need the rock. In some cases, we've seen other projects closer to Boston where they come in and get the rock uh, for free because the materials are valuable to them. I don't expect that we'll have that particular situation here, but the point is, is that the rock ledge number could be a lot less. We think it could be as little as 800,000, but I'm reluctant to say it's gonna be 800 and find out later it's really 1.4. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of play in that rock ledge number and it's hard to pin it down exactly until you guarantee here's the number. There's a, rock, there's a lot of rock and it's somewhere between eight or nine and, and, and 200,000. It's a big spread, but it's hard to pin down because it's an unusual element. The other uh, driver of the cost is our contingency. We've got a 15% contingency. We always have a contingency in pre-construction pricing because we want to be able to accommodate the variability of the bidding environment when the project finally does go out to bid. Hard to say if when you put this job out that if the local contractors are going to be busy and not too hungry for work or they're going to be looking for work. That affects the bid prices. So we always put a contingency and normally we try to have the contingency around 10%. In this case, we've got a 15% contingency and that ends up being $850,000. So that's a big number as well. If we get a good bidding environment, that contingency could go down to zero. We could just be dealing with our straight up estimate for all the different items, which you know, is, is uh, 5.7. So it's a, it's a little bit of a variable to try to pin this down exactly. One thing that I recommend because the ledge seems to be, and it was the last time we did this, the rock ledge was the defining element in whether the project got an up or down vote because it's, it's a lot of money and people had a hard time wanting to pay that. My suggestion would be put the job out to bid and see what you get because you can always pull the bid back if the bids don't come in, in in a level that works for your budget, you can always pull the bid back and not do the project. But it costs you very little money to put the bid out on the street and actually see what the competitive pricing is going to result in. And that way you'd have a real number from several contractors that would tell you where the rock ledge is, for example. And through the competitive process, it would also uh, tend to tighten up that contingency number. So you might find that this project is as I said, a lot lower than the 6.6, .6, it could be, you know, take a million dollars off of that and take some of the contingency, it could be, you know, in the, in the, in the low, low fives. <coughs> Any questions? Questions about the project itself, the different elements that are involved? Go back to the previous slide where the multi-use, the other multi-use field is. Now, are you eliminating those two, uh, I guess a softball and a baseball field over there? Soccer fields are being added? They're not eliminated. We're adding to it. So it's going to be added. So those, those fields are going to be adjusted as well? Those are going to stay. Well, we're not adjusting them as part, as, our con as part of our contract. We're adding this one in. And if you, you know, stripe it differently, you know, you, you could do that outside of the contract. If, if we add any modifications to this, just like we're not modifying this field. So the three fields that are existing right now are not going we're to be not, adjusted? We're not touching those. Correct. Right. And by multi-use fields, it's the two soccer fields. Correct. There's no other application of those fields. Uh, well, so multi-use. Really, this is the multi-use because, you know, it's the, the smaller one, the 6v6, could be used for practices for other elements like lacrosse. Um, or I suppose uh, football if you wanted to do flag football or something, but in a smaller basis. This is the real uh, useful field because it's much larger and can be used for games in all sports. So, natural grass, right? Uh, artificial typically adds another six, seven hundred thousand to one field. The nice thing about artificial turf is that you get to use it over and over and over and over again. The 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 Achilles heel. We see this in all the communities that we work in. The Achilles heel for all municipalities is the intensity of the use. Uh, the other real challenge that we all face in this world of athletics here in New England is that the intensive use season is when the weather is changing. The shoulder season of our climate, spring and fall, it's when we get the most rain. 
And so those fields don't get a chance to dry out properly. They get reused again because you're typically short on field space to begin with because your population has grown. And as the population has grown over 20 years or 40 years, you haven't really added field space. And so you, you, most communities are at a tremendous crunch for space. And so they, they use the natural turf fields maybe when they need to give them a little rest. And so the nice thing about the turf is that you can just use it 24-7. Here in this location, because you're not really abutting any neighbors with the lights, you could play soccer till 10 o'clock at night. You could play at 11 o'clock at night. You really wouldn't be bothering anyone. We just finished a project in our town of Winchester where they put up an artificial turf field and they're out there playing in the wintertime until 9 o'clock because they can just keep using the field. So there is a, a cost benefit. You know, when you hear the price tag on artificial turf, you say, oh boy, and on top of this cost, we're gonna add that. But when you consider what you can get in terms of use, it's almost as if you pick up another two or three fields because you can just use it around the clock. The other thing that Annie and I have talked about, and we talked about this with Lynn way back when we were first awarded the project, uh, we thought from the beginning that this site here, and particularly in your town, would make a perfect, a, a perfect uh, a use for tournaments. There are a lot of towns that try to host tournaments, but they don't have the amenities that Sturbridge has. And those amenities specifically are the great highway access, the centrality geographically that you are for practically all of New England, right? And you've got, actually, you've got hotel and hospitality assets here. Most towns don't have those things. And so the tournaments are going to their towns and they're kind of shoehorning the tournament in to make it work because they've got the fields, but they don't have great highway and they don't have hotels. So I always saw this from the beginning as a great opportunity for you to recoup some of the money that you put into these fields because of your fantastic location and because of the amenities that are here already, because of your tourism base. Yes, sir. If we went to artificial turf, how long does it last? How many years have to replace it? So it depends on the intensity of the use. So, uh, for example, we do a lot of work at Boston College. Now that's a Division I school, and they are using those fields at a nearly professional level all the time. And they cycle through their turf every seven years. They could probably get another two or three, but because they're Division I, they, they replace it. So you're not that. Uh, and you're not going to use it nearly as much, even, w even in your most intense use cycles. You still won't be as intense as they are. Uh, and so you could get as many as 10, 11 years out of it. And so when you do the cost benefit on the replacement, it still comes down to how much extra utility use you're getting out of these fields. Uh, if, you know, in most communities, I think Sturbridge is, is in the same category, uh, there's precious little land left to try to build any fields, never mind a complex like this. And so when you take into account the fact that you may not have another chance to go buy a, a piece of land large enough to add another 11 v 11 or add another baseball, because you know, here's these fields I think get you not quite to break even on what your programming is. So if you still need another field or two to satisfy all the programming that you have, where's that going to come from? And it could come from the artificial that's a cost-benefit analysis that you'd have to go through. We can help you with that and, and kind of program it out. And, and then it would be an interesting exercise to go through and just see <laughs> what other communities have done in terms of tournament revenue and compare that to what you might be able to recoup here and just run those numbers as well. It's, it's a financial projection that um, could be done and you might be surprised. Yes, sir. Is the artificial field something that could be added later without reason a lot cheaper? You, it's, there's no significant technical hurdle to adding it later. Um, the base that we put down might, you, you, you might need to uh, supplement the base a little bit. And if you, in fact, wanted to go in that direction, you know, maybe phase two, uh, we, could, we could modify the design if we needed to to include a base that was suitable for an eventual artificial turf field. So all you had to do was take up the grass and lay down the fabric. What about your so there are two sides to every argument, and there's a lot of research out on, on both surfaces. Uh, some people will look at the artificial turf surface and say that it causes 
or it leads to a more aggressive play uh, and is not as forgiving. The field that we just did for the Winchester Soccer Club uh, is one of the best uh, materials on the marketplace and it's got a, a, a robust rubber uh, infill. And I've been on it myself several times. It's great. And the people who play on it love it. Uh, the downside to a natural turf grass field is that if they're not maintained properly, they can become hard as rocks too. And so there's a maintenance regimen. There's an ongoing routine that the town has to, has to keep up with on the maintenance of the fields, not only to help keep them softer, like you want the natural turf grass fields to be, but also so they can sustain <coughs> that continued use that is inevitably going to come. So it's, you know, it's right down the middle, really. I don't have a definitive yes or no to whether uh, turf is without <coughs> question more injury. We were asked to go in the, in the natural turf grass direction for initial capital costs. I think there was a discussion about turf, but because we were facing some pretty large costs to begin with, the decision back when we did the design in 14 was to stay with grass. So, I'm assuming that none of the uh, maintenance with the numbers that we're looking at on the paper over 20 years, uh, none of it is included in maintenance of the fields. That's correct. Some of the price, the, some, some of the numbers that are uh, uh, the, in the cost estimate include things like, uh, you know, the bases, the dugouts. So there is some equipment built into this number, um, but no maintenance, no. They had landscaping as one of the or That's landscaping to support the project. The original. Yep, that's right. How about uh, how long is this project? Would you estimate that I'd say this is probably a 12, well, I'd say we probably need two construction seasons only because we probably couldn't get everything done in one. Spill over into the spring of a second season, but I'd say it's higher summer. Yeah, it, it, right. Ideally, we'd want to bid this over the winter because that's when the bidding environment is the most competitive. That's when the contractors are hungry. They don't have a lot of work. They finish their summer work. So the ideal time to bid this would be right around January, right after New Year's. Let them stew on it for a, six weeks or so and get prices back so they can have line, <laughs> work lined up for the coming spring. Uh, let them start right about you know, April, you know, late March on the site prep, take the entire season right up until October, November. And it could potentially be done in one season, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, some of the finished items get spilled over to the spring of the following. And, you know, and there again, it depends on how, how mild a winter we have. We've had some real mild winters, and sometimes the little loose ends can be done in November, December, and then you're all ready for the spring. How much of a what variable is that ledger? How much of it do you determine the path to the Well, uh, right. So um, we, we've set up the bid to be a lump sum bid. So we, it's not going to vary. We're going to give the contractors a, uh, we've done some test pit information. Uh, what we could do to try to tighten up that ledge quantity and take some of the risk. You know, anytime there's risk in a, in a bid, the prices go up because there's unknowns. So we've done some limited test pit excavations to identify the ledge. We know it's there, and you could see it in some places. It, it crops right out of the ground. Uh, so one way we could try to enhance the bidding environment would be to do some additional test pits to say, OK, we know where the rock is, and here's the profile. And then that would give the bidders uh, larger confidence, and we'll get a number. Um, but uh, it's not, once we receive the bids, it's, the price is not going to go up. It is what it is. Lump sum, he bids, the contractor bids the job for everything that's included in the bid documents, including the ledge, and he owns the whole thing. And during the time of construction, the other fields would be, there'd be no access to Oh, that's a good question. Let's, uh, mm -hmm. oh. So the first step, right, is to relocate this road. So once you know, we relocate the road first, you know, I, I, you know because here's, here's where most of the work's happening. So once we relocate the road, uh, we could allow access to here and here. Sure. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't be shut down entirely. 
Any other thoughts or questions? Question, how much has been spent on the design so far? I didn't, uh, I didn't come prepared for that one. I have to get back to you. I don't, I don't have that number off the top of my head. We've refreshed our construction estimate in the last several weeks at the request of the town, but we haven't touched this job since 14. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, so a average uh, a backhoe for a day it varies from where you are in the state, but usually about eight hundred dollars a day, including the operator. So let's say we do you know four days of additional test pits, you know, eight times four, thirty two hundred dollars, probably another four three or four thousand dollars for us to document that. So we're at you know, something under ten, maybe seven or eight. Somewhere in there. Any other questions? You had your hand up. Curiosity. I asked earlier if there was a Turner's field. It says it's not a regulation. What size is it? Just out of curiosity. It's regulation. It is regulation. Regulation for the league or regulation? It's a major league field. So the left field fence is 370 yards. It's 90 feet facing. Oh, everything in the field is ready. Right? Six and feet, six and feet. One, that she points out is the length of the outfield fences. Left field is 270 yards. Right field is short because you have the river. Right. That's the only problem. And you just change it, right? Well, another problem is there's land behind turn field. And you can put in other ball fields. I don't know who owns it. I don't know anything about it. The fences could be moved back to make that. The right fence can't because the river's just moved. It's then that that seems maybe she can answer the question. Uh, that's, that seems that right field line is a generous two thirty, and that's being generous. Right. And, and that's the problem. That that's that was the problem. And that that would make it an illegal uh, senior Ruth field. It's a senior league field. Now I want to point out on something. T ball has this many kids. <clears throat> Farm League has this many kids. Farm League has this many kids. Major League has this many kids. When you get to the senior leagues, there's a lot. We had trouble 20 years ago building two teams. So the service hasn't grown enough. That's my only So it has a little league field, 230 as well. It's not a little league field. It's, no, it's, it's, it's 90 field. feet before. I understand. But for the downside, it's a little league field. We don't get those numbers. The president only gives us a, a, an umbrella of little the, board, you can, the, the numbers are, should be public. Bring them to us. <laughs> they should be. How many? We, don't, we just don't have a use for breaking. I can certainly, in the morning, I have all the documentation. I can get that to you. But just something to consider is it's 190 adult players using Turner's. So that's, that's for two different teams. T-ball all the way up to No, nope, that is not including T-ball. That is two adult programs. We have the lead back competitive, and then we have the American Legion, and we're just under 200 participants. So that's not including, like this is, a big part of this plan is to show the need for more than just fields. But another big part of this plan is to recognize that the older community has the same needs. So that number 200, I'm, it's about 190, I want to be as accurate as I can. That is just for American Legion and lead back competitive. That is just our outdoor athletic team. That doesn't include our adult, you know, volleyball, basketball, anything. Those are just the two adult programs, and we're already at just about 200. 
on top of the 290 for child participants. And that's for Little League alone. So it's farm league, minor leagues, major leagues, and senior leagues. That's one, two, two three, leagues, four different leagues. Two leagues. You have 290 people? In no, fact, two leagues, 190 people. That's adults only. Then the Little League program, which you can break down into the age divisions if you like, that's about 290. And that's farm league. Minor that's league, all the under 18. And, and the senior league. Not including the senior league. Okay. Which is over 13, right? This, the two programs, they're 18 and up. The league back competitive in the American Legion. Well, major leagues used to be maximum of 12 years. You're right. 13 and over are going to play on a major league diamond. Correct. And how many major league kids do you have? Well, that, that's going to differ in usage know. only because Little League is Sturbridge sponsored, so it's only going to play within the town. Whereas okay, 13 so and over, over, 13 and over will travel, so they'll share field usage. Correct. My question is, Major League was 11 and 12 year olds. Okay. Yep. Yeah. How many of those do you have? There are. I'm actually texting Brian right now, the president. I believe they have two teams. Okay. Minor leagues are. Nine and ten year olds, how many of those teams do you have? Seven. Farm leagues, and some people move up, are eight I don't know and seven that year olds. Mm -hmm. How many of those teams do you have? That one I don't know off my head. Well, my point is that as it gets into major leagues, you have less teams. Right, they whittle down. As they get older, some kids decide they don't want to play baseball anymore. Right, I'm just, I'm just trying to envision why. See, my kids play at Burgess. They play, there's a major league field at the junior high school. There's a major league <coughs> field at the high school. We have Turner's field. Can I interrupt you on one second? We don't control those fields at the junior high or the high school. They're not ours. You might ours. want to talk to them. We don't control those fields. You might want to talk to them. Okay, when I was the American, when I was the American Legion coach for five years, we weren't allowed to use those fields. I talked to him. I, we weren't allowed to use those fields. I've known Mike Lucas for 25 years. I can't. I've known Mike Lucas a long time as well. That doesn't mean he's going to let me use his fields. <laughs> he's not going to let me use his kitchen if he wants to cook dinner. I'm sorry, I, I, don't mean, to, I don't mean to create a whole asset. No, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm trying I mean, to figure out how we can. The town of Sturbridge doesn't control five school five fields. Seven million dollars for one little league field that points. East West, which you cannot use before 10 o'clock in the morning or after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You absolutely can. Okay. Did you know the Boston Red Sox play day games at 1 o'clock and they have to shade about 400, 400 of their seats? And they and have they seats make that cover it up. All right, well, so let's, the whole let, thing goes let, so let, let, let's just talk about the East West North South thing again. Yeah, so please. certainly <laughs> for, uh, I, I understand, and I understand your problem. So for, for uh, you know, high school kids, even Babe Ruth, you could argue, the ball's moving pretty fast. Uh, you might need that extra uh, advantage of not having the sun in your eye. But for Little League and for this field, the ball's not moving fast enough. The sun is a manageable issue. Yeah, considering, I, I, hang on, considering that I can't do anything else here because of the wetlands. So you see how fat the field is in the outfield? I can't flip that around and point it the other way, and I can't flip it this way either. It just, because of the slope, because of the angle of those two pieces, it, it just doesn't work. So you see, that's part of my problem, and this is Nilo's over here, and our sons play tennis together. When they put the tennis courts in the high school, <coughs> they put them east-west. You can't play in the morning and you can't play in the afternoon. I know it's I know it's less than ideal, but you can play under those uh, you can play under those conditions. So, yes, you have a question. I, I think this is about the future, and I don't think it's about today. And I, I know we have a problem with the system today because I'm going to go out to the living room and play here and here and everywhere. And I think how wonderful to have a, an area located centrally located. You're not bothering neighbors. You're, there is access. You're protected. You're not out near a major highway. You are in a very safe location for the children, which I think to me is paramount as a mother and grandmother. And I think that we're in the midst of doing an open space recreation study. And a lot of, we sent out a questionnaire, and a lot of the, um, uh, people want to stir, which we just got from these outside is evaluating it all, and we've had a lot of 
how we result. But the population is growing older. They want things for older people to do, botchy things. I don't know, other times you can see No, basketball. No, no, basketball. But anyway, um, and then you have a multi-use recreation program. Softball for, for older people, things like that. I think this place is to walk in, just to walk and watch the kids. You have a wonderful view of the river. How lucky are we to have this opportunity? And I also think is looking forward. Skirmish is obviously this plan for all kinds of housing of, in different areas of town. We need recreation for a healthy society. And I believe that um, this provides us, we've done, we paid for this stuff. And I think it's really, like I said, it's looking towards the future. And I think this is what we've seen that people want. They don't just, they want it to be for old people too. And I think that gives us the, and, and I think, uh, and I'm also, like I said, it's not bothering people in a neighborhood with lights and everything, but that's really, really important. Uh, most, most communities are, forced to deal with fields that where neighborhoods have grown up around the fields. Neighbors in the, new, in the houses now are not as tolerant as they once were. <coughs> and, and so you get that conflict where people just don't want it in their backyard anymore. And here you don't have that. The other point I want to make is something that you mentioned as well. We, we're under contract now with the town of North Andover to do an $8.5 million uh, multi-purpose recreational plan. And it's very similar to this. Larger, but similar. And they're into it uh, full bore and it's because they view it as a quality of life and as an amenity for their town just like an investment in their school system. We're also getting a million dollars in um, um, community preservation. So right and they're, they're doing their project with community preservation funds as well. So it, it obviously depends on your perspective but this is the proactive communities value this as a quality of life element to the town that not only attracts families but attracts intergenerational use because with families come parents and grandparents and this is you know this is a, a beautiful place to be walking around at any time forget about whether there's uh, a game yes it's a much bigger um, a much bigger project but yes there's no no rock there uh, lighting and how, as far as getting it down there, how do you the motion? Lighting in the area, you know, kids have to be not down there, or what's going to be the. We haven't worked out the controls yet, but the field lighting would be something that you would turn on and off. Road lighting, we, we can do whatever the town would want us to do there. Leave it on all night, have it, you know, have it go down at a certain time, 2 o'clock in the morning. It's really up to the town how they want us to manage and time that. But you know, because it's a remote location, I would re recommend you have some ambient light there just so that it's not uh, completely dark. But you know, if you lock it, if you prevent access, then you've solved some of that problem. It's going to be a gravel road, and that's, as I mentioned earlier, to reduce the impact of the stormwater runoff that would be created if we pave the road. It's currently a, a dirt road, so that the water goes into it. We'll make it a stabilized gravel, so it won't have as much soil or, or uh, soil in the mix. So it'll be more like a gravel that, that packs up nice and firm, like you'd put under a road base, but still lets the water go through. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? There we go. Good job. I think you've got a unique opportunity here. This is a great project in an, in an area of the town that I think is centrally located. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the wild card for me is whether you could recoup some of that revenue in some of the tournament uh, use. But then, of course, you've got to manage that a little bit, so that comes with a little bit of effort. But you're, you're in a prime position to actually do that. It's, it would be easy to look at some of the other communities who are doing this to see what kind of results they're getting. So. Would there be any chance we could do the test boring that Charlie talked about? It was only 10 grand to go in and get a better idea of the pledge. I mean, that would be something for the committee to discuss first and then uh, seek elsewhere for the funds. But if 
that was something they would be in support of. It seems like an ideal plan. Um, we just have to consider if long term, if it's a necessity or not. Because the lump sum and the bid, it would just be something we, we could explore. Well, what it, what it does for you is it potentially reduces the risk on the bidders. It, it reduces the amount of unknowns that are in the bid, and they can bid submit a bid with greater confidence, which means that the price could potentially be lower. Yeah. It, you know, and again, the more information we can provide, the better their bids can be. Now, you, you mentioned the tournament, and we've been going through a lot of soft tournaments for the past four or five years. And generally, in a good tournament here, is when you're talking about at least four to six softball players, very complex, and really having tournaments. So how would we do that with these fans? Well, so. Right. So when we did the design for this field, we discussed the idea of tournaments, but at the time the committee said, sorry, we're not going to go down that road, so please just do the design. Right. 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 It, I'd have, I'm not aware of the other uh, field capacity in town and how that would work, so I, I can't <coughs> say yay or nay. And, and you, you'd actually want to look at what tournaments you wanted to chase. You, right. you, well, may, you may only chase soccer. You may only chase lacrosse. You I, may only. I'm thinking like, with soccer. Than what I At the time this happened, and it was before I was on, which was four or five years ago, these plans predate everyone here except for... <laughs> they actually, technically, they originate in 95. Chase, they might have been started when you were in high school. Right. Uh, just so you know. Yeah. Um, we didn't have the Plymouth and Parcel then. That's only recently been ours. So we were looking for a piece of land that you know, we could build some, where we thought a tournament could be held. Uh, and to kind of piggyback off of your, your comment, um, we would love to have tournaments, but we may not have the capacity to put four fields in one area. And truthfully, when it comes to asking the schools for permission to use their fields for tournaments, they might be reluctant to give that up because they already give their fields up for flag football, for, for baseball, for their town. They may not want to give up their fields to be a profit thing for people coming in. So we may only have those two fields for that. I can't speak on their behalf. I'm just speculating. And I, and I can't speak educated, educationally, educatedly about the softball fields. I only know from personal uh, experiencing how often the baseball fields are used for baseball, for soccer, and for flag football. They get, they get quite a lot of use for that. Uh, I guess the upper softball field does, but I don't see how much the lower one gets used. Chase, I at least want to come back to your question. Um, so the Plymouth, par the Plymouth Plantation parcel, we, we didn't have, so it wasn't really part of the plan. The other piece you were asking was? Uh, the rec area off Cedar Street. If we removed that hill of gravel and <coughs> sold it, is there enough room? I think we have 14 and a half acres over there. So in, in our capital plan, like our, our long-term plans, uh, that's, that's a part of it, spinning around turners and working with the Plimpton parcel. The spot at the Sturbridge Recreation Center actually does have enough room. And if we wanted to, that would be a great spot to put a, a full-size baseball diamond in, one that didn't have a 200 and generous 30 yard right field porch um, to be <laughs> with a big fence. Miles, with the I've played many of games on that field. So we already have plans for other places. This place utilized um, area already with existing fields to make a larger complex. So that was basically the choice. At Cedar Street would be one isolated field. Um, the Plimpton Parcel we didn't have. We have great plans to help lacrosse and soccer there, hopefully. 
um, and turners in, as we've talked about can only really be one standalone even if we rotate or did whatever we could so this is where that this plan came from and which is why we've worked very hard to get it approved in Good. addition the Plimpton property is also recently marked in the past six months as an endangered species <laughs> for a specific type of snake um, so we most likely fingers crossed, would be able to still put the original plans in, which would be a central location for multiple soccer fields. Um, but this is going to take, the town barn fields took a lot with the wetlands and the turtles and whatnot. So Plimpton at face value sounds awesome and it looks great. And the idea is to easily pop up some soccer fields there. Um, but I mean, living in Sturbridge, we ran into endangered species or protected species. So this is going to be something that isn't as smooth as the community as a whole was expecting. So conservation is going to have to go in, work with us, work with their outside resources to map exactly where these snakes are, what we're going to be able to develop around them, if we're going to be able to have active recreation there or not. Um, but that's just as a small sidebar as to why um, the past year we haven't focused on Plimpton more. The other point to it is that the Plimpton product are sold against the <laughs> and I doubt that there's enough dry land for the ball field. Seems like you're really talking about yes. serious weapons. Well, we did talk about that potential issue. Again, it's right now it's not the, we're not going to get done in the next two or three years. We would have to do work to see about that, but that's the thought. Land-wise, there's enough. With conservation, we're going to have to figure it out, if we can. So is there no room to add more fields here at this point? At this location, no. They're really constrained into the wetlands. Mm -hmm. Now, how many acres are we developing here? Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know. How many acres is it total? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's on the plans here. We wouldn't have a reason to put the amount of space here, so, oh, wait a minute, no. I don't have that. I don't know how much we can relocate DVW. What the Greek treatment yeah. facility? As far as maintenance to these fields, like the mowing, obviously we've got to do fertilization, things of that nature, um, would it be done in-house by our town DPW department, or would it be subbed out by cost? So that actually comes from three different DPW does a great amount of work. We also have, um, from our operating budget, we have each year a certain amount set in. We use True Green, we use them for places. <laughs> um, on top of that, Little League also chooses to maintain their own field professionally and they use an outside source. Um, so it would be a combination of kind of the three options that we have. Fields are also, they're not irrigated. So there's a provision in, in the project to build, uh, to sink a well. But we, for budget reasons, we didn't include irrigation, so that's something that you may want to consider, depending on what your preference is. Yeah. Get the water up the hill, so yeah. We're probably going down there to get the water anyways with, yeah. the, with the well. So. I mean, it's definitely a need that I just left. But I, I have two kids, two and four, where they just played soccer on the pond. My kids are well behaved. I was waiting. I was terrified the whole time. I was nervous. You know, well, Chase, and the, um, the Little League has done a great job maintaining that one field at Darty at Town Barn. And you could, you know, go with Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. Um, we get the field. The community, the, the leagues do a great job of kind of, you know, taking care of their own stuff. Yeah. And they really have. And, I, there's no figure or number I can put on other than a promise, but I mean, the leagues do a great job with it. They've shown that the last five, ten years, oh, so th that I've had children involved in it. So that, that's what that also goes to. So the upkeep costs and whatnot, some of that will be deferred to the leagues in helping out.
the common is really a great point to have if your children have practice on that tonight. Yeah, right. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's just nerve wracking. It's an overall reflection of how crammed we are. Burgess, we don't have priority to. High school, we don't have priority to. So we have our smallest age group playing on, a, loosely speaking, a small grass patch next to a main road. It's a concern for everybody on top of just not having you know, the proper location. We're not providing them with what they truly deserve. But on top of that, it's a historic district. We do have, you know, we're kind of stepping on the tree board's toes by having athletics down there. Just to kind of reiterate that. Okay, give me a second. 205 feet. So, I mean, if you prep it out, it was like, um, Full size soccer, full size baseball, lots of basketball, two playgrounds. I mean, you know, we, you can hear, you know, Barnes may spend six and a half million dollars on these fields versus eight and a half for that kind of conference. And I can see the town, if we had the ability to do that, these are going to be eight and a half million or something like that. I mean, the hot pot here, I mean, I started with it before this, I was like three or three and a half million. But you say it's down to two. No, and it hasn't been, it was never three, three and a half. That's a huge amount of money. Two's a big number. It's something that you get nothing more out of Well, and what I, what I tried to go out of my way to explain is that I also think it's high, and I don't think it's going to come in at $2 million right, 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 at all. I don't think you can go in and say six and a half million, maybe two and a half million is going to be right. expect people to support it. Well, what you can say is it's potentially between eight. 800,000 and 1.2 for the ledge, but we're holding a placeholder at two in this estimate, and if it's two, the project doesn't happen. So that's what I'm trying to say. No. So, so you could put a limitation on the town meeting warrant that says, you know, we're going we're to spend X, but if it goes to this, that means we're out because if the bids come in at this level, we've decided by the vote to, to not go forward with the project and it would all come down to what the market says about the ledge. And that's why I would encourage you to, to find out because it's been the, you know, it's been a million dollar question for four years now. What's the ledge going to cost? And, and I'm hesitant at this early stage to say it's going to be lower, but I actually think it will be lower. We've talked to the different merchants who do this work and we think it's lower. But I'm not the guy who's going to do that work, so I, we, we need the industry to tell us. Here's what it is. Yeah. You, you lose nothing, really, by putting it out to bid, seeing what the industry says, and pull it back. Sarah. You know, we went to Cape less. So how did, the, did we arrive at $2 million as a decision? Well, so what we do is we, we look across the entire state. The, the Mass DOT publishes all of their constru highway construction projects. It's a good database. It's not an ideal database, but many of the elements of this project fall within the same database of the mass DOT projects. So pipeline excavation, uh, fine grading and compaction, creation of the roadway, the creation of the parking. So a lot of the elements that are in this project fall within the database that we pull from <coughs> mass DOT. And these are weighted averages for the entire state and by region. So even the central mass region, we break it down into that fine a, a level of detail. Uh, the apples and oranges piece of, of this is that most of those projects when it comes to the rock ledge excavation are for pipelines, it's not a pipeline. So my only data point for the price per yard to remove ledge and truck it away is on a project that was a pipeline project. 
It's rock excavation. It's just not an entire area where you have some economies of scale where you could pop the rock. You know, when you're doing a pipeline, you sometimes can't pop the rock with explosives because you've got other things to worry about, like underground utilities. So here, we're trying to make apples and oranges work with the best data that we have. There aren't you know, recreation projects within central Massachusetts that have rock ledge. There's just no data that exists on that. So we're trying, we're, we're, we're trying to get, well, so we're trying to get a number that has some basis and we're trying to reconcile it to the conditions that are here and we're doing the best we can with the data that we have. So. Isn't the alleged value to the right contractor? Sure. You know, and when we, so. Take that into account, or this is strictly from a cost perspective? We, we have to play it strictly by cost because I. Because rock would be an asset to the right. So here, what, here what, what, what we did four years ago, uh, when we were wrestling with this very same question, we called uh, rock crushing companies all over New England, mostly in the Massachusetts area, and we tried to get them close to Sturbridge. And we asked them, okay, we've got this project. Here's the location. If we put it out to bid, here's the amount of rock that we think is here. What's your interest? And we got variable answers. We couldn't get any one of them. We talked to four different companies. We couldn't get any one of them to say it's going to be X. <coughs> they asked us, well, is this going to be a bid? Is the, is the work actually going to come out sometime soon? And I had to say no. Okay. Why am I talking to you then? <laughs> if, if, uh, why would I, you know, so the, the rock <laughs> companies were not really eager to jump in and get their hands dirty with the numbers because they knew the job wasn't imminent. So they said, well, you know, when the job's real, come back and talk to me. What we also found when we talked to these folks is that it depends on how much material they have on hand. Some of these guys will stockpile material for years and they've got a huge supply and they don't need any more rock. There were two of the folks that we talked to who said that to me verbatim. Look, it's great that you've got all this rock, but I have no interest because I've got a ton of it. I don't know what to do with it. But what you need is to line it up at exactly the right time. The other variable is that the further away you go to get the rock removed, you know, the contractor, the more costly it is because trucking is a big expense here. And we looked around. We really can't hide the rock on the site. So we might be able to take it out of this location and, and it would be a lot cheaper if we could find a place here at this site to, to spread it around and reuse it. But we're so tight, we're so hemmed in with the fields that we can't just make a rock pile someplace. So there's a trucking element in this as well. So you know, we're trying to find rock, rock companies that are close to Sturbridge, that don't have a lot of materials, and that are eager to do this. And it's just not many of those. And that's really you know, actually active during this. You did this once. Yeah, we did it four years ago. Yeah, four years ago. Things could change. Yeah, things could be completely different now. Right. You said weighted average, which is something that I'm not familiar with. Is that the mean, the medial, or the mobile average? <laughs> so, I, 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 I'm sorry. The weighted average. I, I, I don't know what weighted average means. Okay. So weighted average means that they have, in a given year, in, in all the districts of Massachusetts, they have, let's say, 500 different projects. Each one of those projects has different elements, but some of them all have, you know, site prep and pipeline excavation and roadway subbase and all the rest. And so they take okay. those bids from actual projects, they tabulate them. <coughs> you can look at the average of those bids for that region, and then you can compare. No, I'm just telling you what it is. Third grader, that's third. That's third grade math. Not third grade Okay, so any other questions? So I one for, Charlie, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, so asking about the ledge and how expensive it is. 
would you as a service resident be more apt to vote uh, yay for this if there was a cap on how much could be spent on that excavation? Well, I guess it would depend on um, how realistic it was. And if I voted for it, I'd, I'd want to see the project go forward. I mean, that would be you know, the whole idea. I, I think the big thing here is to try to get the best price you know, estimate possible you know, on that. Because whether it's 800000 or $2 million, it's still an awful lot of money when it takes away from other things that could be there. I mean, here we could spend $6.7 million on this thing. We're not going to have restrooms. I mean, you know, even the gravel road, I don't know how much more it is. I've heard of these pervious asphalt things that have things drained through. I mean, how much would it add, you know, to, to be able to do something like that and still have, you know, water get into the ground water? I mean, if we're going to spend this kind of money, I, I, I think we'd like to, you know, feel that it's going to be you know, the best product in the community. And certainly, you know, the albatross on the net would have an 800 or 2 million for the, for the ledge is a big deal. It really is. And the question of what we're getting out of this is what it costs. Yeah, and, and that go, that went into a lot of the discussion around it because, you know, I'd love to have a paved road. I'd love to have bathrooms down there. I'd love to have another field down there. I, there's a lot of things I would love to have down there. And like I was talking about, you know, Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams, Build and They'll Come. I also referenced the, the field that's already down there and what the Little League has done for that field already with the dugouts, with the batting cages, with building their concession stand, you know, all that they've done to add to that field already. I, 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 I mean, I'm not sure to say it's an empty promise because of what they've already done. I hope that in the future, we will have restrooms down there. I mean, I hope we can get, you know, some other things down there. But as it stands right now, I want to get fields there. And so my question was, if there was a hard cap on that, you know, would, would that, do you as a voter think that would help sway you? Because I don't want to gouge, you know, the taxpayers at all either. And I understand exactly what, you know, with water, with what they're doing, Waterfield Design's doing, is they, they don't want to come back and say, look, look, you know, we said 100, it, I mean a million, it's now 2 million, they look bad for that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I get what they're doing. I mean, I think it would be worth spending small money to try to get as, as good an idea as possible of you know, what the ledge really is going to be. And I'm not opposed to that at all. And the reason that I had asked initially how much we spent on the design already is that, um, you know, we do have the point that I, I didn't know about the but I mean, if we're talking about, let's say, five and a half, six acres, it's not like we're messing with this developed area. Right. We have 15 there. And I don't know what the, you know, the park is up there, if it's level or anything else. But I mean, it, it depends is, you know, how much we have invested in, into this and what we're really getting from it, I guess is the question. But, you know, to answer your question, I mean, I think that the firmest price we can have, you know, estimate on, on the ledge is very Okay. I, I, I can't imagine people voting for this thing might be as much as $2 million that we're spending out of six point five million just to be So one of the things we could do as part of that uh, test pit additional that we were talking about earlier, trying <coughs> to refine the ledge quantity, is maybe go back and canvas the contractors again four years later, find out where they're at, see what their tolerance, their interest is, and try to get more information out of these local lots of local uh, ledge contractors to see if we can add more intelligence to that. I hope we don't have to go to the town and the four year old We've updated the, the, the cost to 2017. Okay, you, just, you just estimated the update. Yeah, right. We didn't go back out. We didn't go back out. There's also a mechanism called add alternates where you could this would be a big one, but you know, if, if you were trying to pick a number that you didn't want to exceed, you could do the road, do this field, do the small field, do the parking, do the bocce, and leave this for phase two because you, you didn't get enough of an appropriation. And now you've got a much smaller number. You get a lot less, but you've now set the stage for phase two. And, yeah. It seems like you said most of the light is on that field. It's this one, yeah. But you get a lot less by doing it that way. Right. It's coming. You certainly ledge is a drawback, but the benefit of building here is uh, you're, you're leveraging the, thing, the assets you already have. You're making it better. I mean, I've been walking through the Clinton Park and the 
that was shown the area where that light signal is supposed to be. It was very, not very loud. So you may not have to blast it, but you have to put a lot of film in after blast. Or you may be able to file it Well, that's 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 in fact what the material. Well played, well that, that's that's in fact what the material is. But we we don't we don't have a crushing plant on the site to con to convert. Yes, they do. But that's up to the. You're yeah, right. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Your time tonight. Really appreciate it.